we're gonna we're gonna watch this clip. The thing that like I guess what is it like piqued my interest on it is that uh let's back at this. It's from Sun News Media. But when I found it, it was posted on the National Posts website. Okay. And it's weird because so Jonathan K writes for the National Post. So that itself doesn't surprise me. But it was posted in 2008. So this is after the fallout of like what happened in Charlottesville and like Ezra pretty much being deplatformed by everyone. The National Post website was just like, yeah, we're going to share this clip of just uh, Jonathan K and Ezra sh shooting the shit. And like the other weird thing is it's, it's only got like 500 views. <laughs> so it's, it hasn't been viewed. How many subscribers does National Post have? Uh, 80, 80, that's pathetic yeah for one of that's, the biggest papers in the country that's, like that's horrifically pathetic jeez <laughs> that's really bad hold on let's do the math real quick nom says national post purchased sun media and all of its material and video tron interesting yeah the, the thing that's like weird about this one in particular is i mean like regardless of how you you conceptualize national post's relationship with sun media this interview is is very like open to there being like a an interest between them even though like uh they still try to pull off this idea like the national post post is a little bit more of a like a serious journalist outlet it's just weird to me that like this clip sort of like praises the necessity of a Sun News. It praises the necessity of a Sun News. In particular, it praises the necessity of people like Ezra. And this is coming after what happened in Charlottesville when most people in the media don't want to talk to Ezra. And also is coming particularly after Sun Media shut down when clearly there was no at least monetary interest in the project within this country. Uh, liberal? Uh, no, we are not liberals here, but we are not right wingers. We are far to the left. So, yes, communists would be uh, an appropriate term. And if that scares you, I'm I'm sorry. Do you believe in the fact of two genders? No, I I actually do not think that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> But sadly, we're not talking about that today. We are going to talk about uh, Jonathan Kay. Who, who is one of these people who, uh, I mean, believes in, in two genders? And uh, I should note, he's the editor. Not only is he a National Post writer, he's the editor of the Canadian version of Quillette magazine. He's also, if I could like throw it in here too, is I have one of his books that I got at a used bookstore long before I even really knew who this guy was or even knew who his mother was, who's also a huge fucking transphobe. Uh, he wrote a book called Among the Truthers, which was sort of like criticizing the 9-11 truth movement. And I remember reading it. Can't really tell you much more than that, but I do remember reading it. Uh, and I have it still on my shelf. I almost want to go back to reading it just to see like, now knowing who he is, whether I get a different like vibe after uh, reading. Yeah. <laughs> so what was their last tweet? Uh, since Tony is saying something about segregation, but there. <laughs> uh, and you are pro vax mandate, aka new segregation. Yeah. Um, um, oh, Dan's post is that I <laughs> there are two sexes: the sex your dad and I had, and the sex your mom and I had. I love that Duke. They got the actual like Duke Nukem voice to like say that. Incredible. If they had just stayed with like the gender thing, then I was gonna be like, no, we're radical Bidenists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are at least three, <laughs> which is still like the best thing that I think Biden has ever said. <laughs> like wait, somebody wait, asked wait. him how many genders there are, and he said at least three. Yeah. <laughs> at least oh, three. Yeah. Well, that's that's yeah. pretty good, Biden. Yeah. Pretty good job. I know. <laughs> it's a very. <laughs> uh, There's no, at least yeah. three. <laughs> no, you didn't miss the weirdo. They they pretty much came and went. It was pretty quick. 
And they didn't really say anything to me. But, uh, yes, so uh, in line with Biden, we are going to criticize uh, Jonathan Kay. So <laughs> here we go. I love that the introduction of their show says two years of telling it like it is. <laughs> well, what do our competitors have to say about us? Well, here's an article that appears. So this was in 2011 when this uh, sit down was happening. Here in the National Post, it was about our coverage of one of my favorite subjects, David Suzuki. David Suzuki is a poster boy for why Canada needs the Sun's brand of journalism, written by Jonathan Kay, who joins us in studio now. Jonathan, welcome to the show. How are you? He's Good. So You've been here before. Now you're excited a and fast. <laughs> Well, for one, he was younger uh, back in what? 2011. Only 10 years. It's only been 10 years. Yeah. 10 years ages, uh, aged Ezra. He's like 50 now, though. So, like, I mean, he was in his 40s back back here? Yeah. Or late oh, 30s? I'm sorry. You, the, the, the 40s are when you're young and spry, is it? <laughs> and the 50s are when you're early. So is that, is that the way that goes? I know. Uh, he I, just, like, had money for Coke back then. Probably. <laughs> I think the bigger divide between the sluggishness and fast pace is between 50s and 60s. Like, even watching, like, my parents from going from 50s to 60s, uh, that definitely happened. But uh, I think he's also, if, if I were to sort of, like, understand why he's excited here, is because he's like, hey, the National Post is saying something, like, nice about me. And so, like, he gets to promote it, and he's excited about that. I think, like, they've always even when they were a part of Sun News Media, had this idea of like wanting uh, the rest of the, the media to take them seriously kind of thing, you know? Hate ages you. <laughs> yes, exactly. I used to work at the Post way back in the day with you, but I mean, we, we're rival companies. I mean, every dollar you earn is probably a dollar we don't. But tell me what you think about the Sun's place in the media firmament. Well, what I admire is you take on sacred cows. Uh, and David Suzuki, obviously, is one of them. He's a kind of a, a hallowed figure in Canada. And, uh, yeah, I do admire the way you're unconstrained by taboos in your selection of targets. Um, and I think, broadly speaking, it is good to have at least one, what I would call a dissident voice on both sides of the political spectrum. And right now, I think you're occupying what I would call the dissident right. I think you're right. I mean, I like to use the... So this is why it's like weird to me that they would promote this after what happened in uh, Charlottesville. <laughs> it posts this on their website as if signaling yeah. that like what we need is a dissident voice on the right wing. You know, the same people who uh, sent reporters who then went on a neo-Nazi podcast and participated in a neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville. You know, I was going to say like the very first thing that john k said was just the least covert racist thing anyone has ever said like oh we need someone to like you know put what what, is it, what was it specifically said i'm a little bit drunk taboos. already it was kind of like yes there it is yeah, there yeah. it is yeah challenge that taboo that people are equal well, do that ezra go for it the, the taboo that they're fighting for here at least is this idea of like david suzuki being like this untouchable famous canadian person but like the reason why David Suzuki gets so much praise is because uh, he's been right most of the time. <laughs> you know, he's been a uh, he's he's a famous Canadian for being an environmental activist and a science communicator, and so I think that's that's good that he is. And then here's the thing: is I've even disagreed with David Suzuki, but it's not about him being some sort of like sacred, untouchable human being or how, however they're making it out to be. It's just that a lot of people like David Suzuki. So, like, yeah, you could still call him out when he's wrong. And who who says that you can't? Like, this is the thing that, I mean, this has been a, a mainstay between all of, like, conservative media. It's like, the, you can't talk about so and such a such a topic or else you'll be canceled and forever, like, tarnished. And it's like, no, just don't don't be wrong and racist. <laughs> then, then you're free to, or bigot. I, I should expand racist to just bigotry generally. But you could talk about all kinds of things. I criticize David Suzuki when it comes to genetically modified organisms. I think he's been pretty wrong on that front. Uh, but beyond that, he's he's got some pretty uh, base takes on the climate, and I'm cool with that. 
Do you, out of curiosity, do you know who David Suzuki is, Elrond? As the American? I probably should, but I am an American and I've also been drinking, so no. no. <laughs> well, I just I didn't know how much. I think he's more of a Canadian figure. Uh, he He's mostly, he did a show on the CBC for like the longest time called On the Nature of Things. But uh, he also debated. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I just Googled them and I'm like, the name sounds familiar. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Okay. Not the same page. Same page from here. Don't be wrong and racist. Shameless political bias from Imperial News. <laughs> yeah. The phrase rebel journalism. Right, right. I mean, that's a little bit. Oh, this is like the other reason why I wanted to play it because uh, so he says we need more dissident media. And then uh, Ezra goes, what I want to call it is like rebel uh, like media. To use the phrase rebel journalism, right, right. I mean, that's a little bit of fun, but I think we are dissidents on, and not just on political issues. Maybe, so maybe like there was like a nugget in the back of his head that he already was thinking that he wanted to call it rebel media. So I think that's kind of interesting. That this is, this is four years before they started rebel. Socially, I mean, you, you made a remark once that, I mean, Canada's a fairly small place. And if, you, if you're in the media, political, cultural circles, you bump into the people you write about. I mean, I savaged Michael Ignatieff, and then one day, actually you were there, I went to a Writers' Trust event, and we checked in at the same time. It's uncomfortable to be really tough on cultural leaders in Canada, because odds are you're going to bump into them at some dinner party someday. It's tough to do that. Like, I... The point he's making, I completely agree with, is that there's a lot of insiders in media because, yeah, there's the, the fact that if you want access, it's awkward writing negative things about the people that you're going to be around all the time, right? Agree with that point. But seriously, what the hell was with that camera shot? It's like what we needed was rather than just like face and face, we need the... We need the camera person. I went to a Writers' Trust we event. We checked in at the same time. Up. It's uncomfortable like, no, to be <laughs> really tough on cultural leaders in Canada because odds what? are you're going to bump into them at some dinner party someday. It's tough to do that. The like, it's, it's almost like that gives it this vibe. Like, we're doing the interview on the street, which is why it's in the studio. <laughs> that feels like an in-between segment on, like, a kid's show type of thing. <laughs> like, that kind of camera. Like, it feels like... Like the late aughts on like, just like pretending to be like, whoa, we're cool and with it. It media feels like reality things. TV kind of vibe too. Yeah, um, yeah. Too. The other thing that just like hit me right now is, you know, it's on Sun News. They got the big Sun News thing on this TV thing in the background. And it says, why Canada needs Sun News. Isn't that a weird thing to be platforming on your like news outlet? Why Canada needs this program that's happening right now. We should have that as a running thing. the grift. The Why Canada needs Imperial News. The problem with Canada is it's a small country. There's uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal. There's a couple of hundred people who are the elite editors. They're the columnists. They're um, you know, well-known professors. And what happens is if you're in journalism for a long time, eventually you create friendships with those people. You see them at dinner parties, you see them at award shows, handing little statuettes to each other. Um, and you become constrained in what you choose to say about them. And I think David Suzuki is the sort of person who there are a lot of journalists in Canada who, well, you know, one day hopefully I will be in that uh, echelon of famous Canadians. And, and they do, it may be unconscious self-censorship, self but it's self-censorship. One of the things I admire about Sun is that um, I don't think there's, there's the same sense that they are in that little echo chamber of elitists. That they, I mean, it's almost self-conscious the way they say, we are outside that, you know, that mainstream that aspires to that respectable status. We are going to be outside of that. And again, I think there's some value in that. I mean, that the, the funny thing here is, Sun has always been connected with the Conservative Party in Canada. Like this, this whole notion that somehow they're dissident or they're outside of the mainstream. I mean, it wasn't until 2017 where the conservatives stopped talking to Rebel News. And even today, the co-host or the co-founder of Rebel News, who's no longer associated with Rebel News, Brian Lilly, who still writes for the Toronto Sun, which is uh, where Sun Media comes from, this channel. Brian Lilly still writes for the Toronto Sun. And didn't it come out recently that his wife is 
like works for Doug Ford and the Doug Ford administration? Didn't that come out? Yes. I don't remember what she did. It's something related to media relations or whatever, though. Well, just Googling it to see. And it doesn't want to Google. I wonder if Lily is still uh, banging Ford's comms manager. Okay, that's what it is. It was communications manager. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it's not his wife. Maybe it's just a girlfriend, but still. So it's like this idea that somehow, like, Sun, Sun News is outside of the mainstream is just so not true. Oh, they're outside of the respectable status already. I mean, they should be. I'm, I mean, I'm surprised Sun News is still around. But... And Rebel itself, now that they're off, I mean, should be even more outside of the mainstream than they are. Which is, again, like, why are they platforming here? It was weird, too, because a year from National Post posting this on their website, uh, the Globe and Mail posted uh, an op-ed written by Ezra in 2019. And then there was all the... The National Post had sort of like glowing coverage of the fact that Rebel won its lawsuit recently to get led into the 2021 uh, election debates. So... Frank Mag or Black Locks figured it out in like 2018, 2019, and all the Queen's Park shitted... Or shithead journalists said fuck all about it. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. Well, sometimes, I mean, especially when the rest of the uh, media seems to be in a in a clump, when everyone agrees on something, I think it's important to have a counterweight. I mean, we've talked about this before. You've come on the show to talk about Omar Cotter. I think that most of the other newspapers in this country and TV stations wanted to bring him back to Canada. But the Sun, we were on a campaign to stop him. We didn't succeed. But I think... Every now and then, I, I use the phrase media party, consensus media, where I say, well, look at that. The, the Post and the Globe and the Star and the CBC, they've taken one point of view. I almost feel like I want to take a dissident point of view just to say, hey, I don't all agree. I'm not part of that team. I mean, that, that's not. Like, notice, like, all, like, the, are, like, the pre-things to, to what Rebel News became, which is, like, there's this media party out there that, like, we're going against. Yet, think about how weird that is in the context of what we're watching right now, where a National Post writer is on the show praising the need for rebel media, yet he just lumped in National Post with the media party. <laughs> like, this is why it's like it's so weird that they, like, they have this front of being dissident and being a rebel. Yet they really, like, the, that's like the irony of our name as Imperial News. It's like, really, like, they are a part of the Imperial Corps, you know what I mean? They're just like all the other fucking uh, courtiers and shit like this with uh, having a, a close proximity to power, you know? This also Jody, Jason Kenny, and oil executives are dissidents. Yeah. <laughs> They're fighting against the eco-Marxist Justin Trudeau and... Joseph Biden, and, uh, you know, they're, we need to support it when the reactionary nobility is like, ah, this king's too nice to the serfs, or whatever, you know? <laughs> That's a true rebel. There's also, like, the fakeness of his rebelness, too, because he's just, like, it's, like, contrarian for contrarian's sake. It's like the idea is like, I almost just want to be against whatever the media party does just so that I can be the dissident, so I can tell the other story. And it's like, no, maybe maybe what you should be going for is truth and not just contrarianism for contrarian's sake. It's also the fact of like this Omar Cotter thing is he, he's never let that go. He's written a book about it. He talked about it on Sun Media. He still to this day on his fucking show brings this up constantly. And every time he says it on a show, we mentioned it on the podcast because that's all he just can't get over this fact that uh, I mean, he can't get over the fact that Omar Cotter was brought back to Canada. The future Ezra is going to be super pissed that Justin Trudeau and the liberal government settled with Omar Cotter for $10 million. And he never lets that go. When it's like Omar Cotter, for those who don't know, any Americans that are listening, was a was a child in Afghanistan whose parents, uh, they went to Afghanistan during the Afghanistan war. And 
he survived a, an interaction with American soldiers and was accused of, I guess, shooting and killing a American soldier. The evidence there is very weak. We've gone over it in like other areas, but you can look into it. The evidence there was pretty weak, but he was kept in Guantanamo for years where he was tortured and abused, uh, all because he was 15 years old in Afghanistan and uh, was accused of murdering an American soldier and brought there because his parents. So yeah, so our government was like, since we allowed you to be tortured in Guantanamo forever, here's some money, all this fun stuff, and Ezra will never let it go because the guy's a Muslim. That's pretty much how it works. Because he's an Islamophobe, but we've been over that. Too. Tons and tons of tons on the show. Uh, I'm not to say, uh, to say that I'm always right and they're always wrong, but I think we need to have a counterweight sometimes. I think sometimes it helps to have the mindset of an, of an activist. Um, one thing I've, I've told people about you. I mean, that's the other thing. They love to be called an activist. But I, I wanted to acknowledge how the, the heading here has changed now to two years of troublemaking. <laughs> I love how they're trying to celebrate themselves. We've been sticking it to the man for, for two years on this show on cable news. The only thing I'm worried about is that Omar Khadr case sets a precedent that Canada can't torture people. Uh, I do appreciate your, your sarcasm, too, Kairos, but oh my god, that one, that one cuts too deep, too real. My opinion is that you're an activist who, who has a TV show, um, and I think there's a lot of people that sound like that. Um, and sometimes you need an activist sensibility to really be a contrarian. I think Teresa Spence is a good example, some of the coverage you had, uh, the Occupy movement. Uh, you guys didn't buy the social justice angle. You were very much about illegal occupation of public spaces. Um, and I think it's very much an activist mentality. And again, you know, I think the, the National Post is quite different from the Globe and CBC and CTV and the way they cover things, but we are not what I would call activists mm. when it comes to the issues that you cover. Well, you're right. And this is the funny thing is like, he's right about this. And even today, like Ezra pitches himself as we're an activist. We're all, he's even said several times now that like, we almost do more activism than we do actual reporting. And frankly, that's all they've ever done. If it, like, activism loosely described here as like not reporting things but just stirring shit and like uh trying to get people to say protest vaccine mandates and stuff that are happening now but like to me this has always been like an issue with their journalism in the first place which is like it would be one thing if they were completely honest about the fact that they're pitching a particular angle but they sell this idea like we're just telling it as it is or telling the truth and uh but then, like, the activism part is associated with that, but it's, it's based on the lies of the, the first half, you know? Because they're not telling the truth. And, and they're just they're an astroturf campaign to get people protesting vaccine mandates. Or even back then, they were protesting Occupy. And another thing they protested was I don't know more, you know? So these, it's the same thing today as them protesting the rail blockades and protesting what's It never fucking ends. And I do love this stance here that like Occupy is bad because people are occupying public space. And you know, I I am never shy about saying I don't think I've ever called myself a reporter in my life. I mean, I do not go out and say I have no point of view. Let me gather all the facts and come back and whatever I find. I I know what I believe stuff. in. And he definitely calls himself a reporter nowadays. So. Uh... <laughs> Actually, that face reminds me of this here. So we'll I'll throw some of this in the chat. Here. There we go. Just so we know what he's saying. Activist mindset is to never inconvenience people in any way. Yeah, yeah. And and I don't hide that. What bugs me sometimes, like I read the Toronto Star, and and sometimes I say, well, this looks like a news report, but this is very ideological. This is. The, the, if you notice the video in the background, I think is him rummaging through people's tents during like an Occupy rally. Like, look at this. Isn't when it comes Ezra? to the issues that you cover. Well, you're right. And, you know, I, I am never shy about saying, saying I don't think I've ever called myself a reporter tent. in my life. I mean, I do not go out and say, I have no point of view. Let me gather all the facts and come back and whatever I find. I, I know what I believe tent. in. And, and I don't hide that. What bugs me sometimes, like I read the Toronto Star, and, and sometimes I say, well, this looks like a news report, but this is very ideological. This is the opposite of me. I mean, I, I'm right wing there. Like, what was that clip? That was just him rummaging through somebody's tent. 
He's an activist, all right. Left wing, I call myself an opinion commentary show. Uh, they call themselves reporting, but I don't. I, I, that's what bugs me about the media party sometimes is that when the, when they're actually on a mission, they're pretending. Oh no 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 no! We just think Justin Trudeau is great. That's not that's not an affection we have. It's just straight report. That's what bugs me. That might be a sort of a, a drawback of of what you call the media party. However, on the other hand, to give the Toronto Star their their credit where it's due, they they do have hundreds of reporters. They do a, do a yeah. fairly good job of reporting. And again, uh, to be fair, that's I think one of the drawbacks of Sun is that. You're heavy on the activism. I think some of your critics would say sometimes you're light on some of the news that a conventional outlet like, like, like the Toronto Star or the National Post would supply. Um, and I think that's the, that's the stress you sometimes see in the way Sun pre presents itself. It's a I, I love like the subtlety there. You're light on the news. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, there's no, you know, the issue with you calling yourself a news organization is that you offer no news you're light on the facts <laughs> you don't offer any details that would explain things you just push a point of view you know my god and like then why like and then part of that is like on top of that is why would he pitch this as if it's a good thing It's a news channel, but there's a lot of activism, sometimes not as much news as some of the other, other well, outlets. I, I like to think we split it. Our primetime guys do the commentary. I mean, we've done some amazing on-the-ground reporters. I mean, in places where, like, for example, Lisa Morozik has gone to Indian bands, the Kawakatoose Indian band. I don't think a reporter's ever set foot on there. So, I mean, I, I take your point. Listen, you're a very generous critic to come on the show and be gentle and friendly towards us. I love the fact that The Sun has added to the to the array of voices out there. I think the more voices, the better. And I appreciate you for accepting that because some of our competitors don't want the sun around. Jonathan K. National Post, great to see you again today. <laughs> so the last final thought I have on this video is that notice as well there was the like it was like the Fox News defense. Because Fox News would always get away with the fact that like, well we're still news because during the day when we have like our news people like that's the news but then like late at night when you have like a tucker carlson or a sean hannity or what used to be bill o'reilly uh then that was like the opinion section and ezra's like i'm like the opinion section i'm not i'm not a reporter i'm not a news although that sort of like blurring distinction there has been totally removed because they were i mean they're now uh rebel news not just rebel media and he constantly talks about the stuff they report. But uh, if I could say one last thing about uh, Jonathan Kay, it's that he once thought that his shampoo uh, was for humans and it was for ducks. <laughs> <laughs> and I will never not love that fact. So I'm, I'm just going to read this. It says, uh, Canada is no longer lending to the United States its best celebrities. At one point, its most famous cultural expats. Uh, we don't need to read this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the guy who tweeted about not realizing he was using dog shampoo for a couple of months. So it says here, so it turns out I've been using dog shampoo on my hair for the last few months. I only discovered it when I ran out and needed to get more. This is partly my own fault, but it doesn't help that Arm & Hammer has the word in like four point typeface. I'm guessing this is Tom <laughs> on the post of the picture. And then he deleted the tweet. So now we can't even check out what the picture is. But uh, he used dog shampoo on his hair and his complaint compl took to Twitter to complain to Arm and Hammer for the print pet being too small. But it is worth noting when you look at the shampoo bottle that he originally posted, it had a giant picture of a dog on it. I love that was just set dressing the same way that they have fruit sometimes and waterfalls. Sometimes you just want to smell like a dog. Yeah. I love that Seth Rogen just tweeted at him. You're stupid. <laughs> uh, I'm not trolling you. This is objectively stupid. I honestly have no clue who you are beyond this stupid tweet. 
I do love it. Oh my god, and then he went on Fox News about it? Okay, we gotta watch this. I forgot that he went on Fox News. To went on Fox it. News about the dog shampoo? Yeah, anyway, yeah and it's with, uh, apparently it's with, uh, with Mark Stein, who is uh, another Canadian on Fox News, but who is associated with Rebel. He has, he's the one with the cat video. He sings about cats. He had a whole album dedicated to cats. The Q this time, two cars, I think is referring to Quillette. But, uh, Wait, it's that guy? It's the cat guy? Yeah, he's, he's got like, I thought I saw a pretty cat sleeping up on No, i no, no, okay, that's enough. No, I remember. I just, I don't need to hear it again. <laughs> I just didn't, didn't click for me that that's, that's cat guy. That's the cat man. Yeah, Mark Stein. He, he also wrote a book called, uh, fuck, what's it called? America Again or something like this. And it was, uh, it pretty much argued for a sort of like, great replacement theory that like Muslims were taking over in the West and we're going to outpopulate everyone. He's uh he's terrible. Yeah, uh we're going to do it. We'll we'll watch the cat a bit of the cat guy after this uh even to Elrond's uh protestations. We will play a little bit of oh. it just to give you a oh. taste. That was great. Do you just want to be clear my protestations as well? Um, just I gotta since I brought it up I have to give you a taste but first we'll watch this and because uh, apparently Jonathan K went on Fox News to complain about the dog shooting and none of it went anywhere until the other day when he did a throwaway tweet revealing that for the last three like, months he'd act look at this image it has a fucking dog on it like looking at this <laughs> it's so great on it <laughs> It's just soothing oatmeal shampoo with the dog on it. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I like how they, like, they, they've they clearly moved it to the thing that says Nivea for men in the background to make it look like this is, like, a normal thing that happens. Yeah. It's not. It's really not. No, it's not a normal thing that happens. Like, they wouldn't even be in the same area in the store. Like, there's no way that this would happen. I was going to let that part go, but yeah, they'd be in completely separate aisles. Lord. Accidentally been washing his hair with his dog's shampoo. And next thing you know, big-time Hollywood star Seth Rogen and small-time lefty hack Keith Olbermann and the rest of the blue checker were pounding on him. Jonathan Kay oh, yeah. uh, joins us Oh, they're uh, pounding, tonight. huh? Uh, Jonathan, as I think you put it in one of your tweets, uh, this this escalated rather quickly. Yeah, <laughs> oh, ten it years was really strange. Strange. Jonathan. It was supposed to, yeah. to be yeah. this self... Well, I mean, after you self-owned you on Twitter that time. Deprecating joke, and, uh, you know, I, oh, my God, I a joke. tweeted it, and then I, I don't know, I think I walked my dog, and then I checked my phone, and it was like, Seth Rogen. Notice as well, like you can barely make it out here, but it says uh, soothing oatmeal shampoo, and then it says uh, four pets. <laughs> I mean, it's not really, he, he made it sound like it was really small. He said it's like four point typeface. Like, no. Was well, it's a joke. <laughs> calling me names. I know, I know. It, was, it was just a self deprecating joke. I didn't mean it, guys. Yeah. I was just trolling. Just trolling. I didn't mean to self own myself. So it was a very surreal way to spend my Sunday morning. And then uh, that thing that happens that you really don't want when you're in a Twitter spat with Seth Rogen is that your mum decided to chip up on you, oh chip in on your behalf <laughs> and suggest that he work this in. How is this like this? Does not help him. This makes him seem like. Oh my so god. Okay, Barbara Kay says, Seth, don't trust Jesse Brown, who envies John Kay's greatest success. John is a top journalist, well known for his quirky sense of humor. Oh my god, this is his mom talking. I think you should write this train uh. into your next movie script. John should play the pet shampoo guy. I should mention that I am John's mom. And then Jonathan goes, uh, yeah, thanks mom, but I got this. Oh. <laughs> oh. That's so embarrassing. I'm sorry, John. That's, I think that's the thing, though, like, 
it's hilarious to think that John K was like using pet shampoo, and I appreciate that that's his his AVI is the pet shampoo thing. But also, like, this is a lot of fucking time, everyone, to spend on this stupid fucking tweet. And that goes for you too, Seth. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. Like, it's okay. This is dumb. We can move on. We don't need to devote fucking hours of airtime and neurons to this bullshit. I mean, we do because there's other assholes in this world who take Jonathan K seriously. And the point of us doing this is to be like, this guy should not be taken seriously. <laughs> You know, we don't we don't yes, need to hear what I, Jonathan K has to say about race and IQ. We don't need to hear. Well, I mean, to be fair, that's I, I think that's because I'm coming from that standpoint of already of like I don't care about this person's opinions, just like I don't care about Seth Rogen's opinions. <laughs> so there you go. Oh my god! Into a subplot for his next movie, and you didn't appreciate that. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's not a good look uh, when family members jump in. Uh, but I was very disappointed in Seth. And by the way, I just, you know, at first, uh, you know, my response to him was like, look, maybe this guy's going through a bad thing. He got into spats with with, with certainly people who are more famous than me, like Gad Saad and Rudolph Giuliani. And I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. I said, hey, look, I love your movies. You know, you know maybe you're having a bad weekend or something like oh. that. And, but I, like, I kind of gave him the opportunity to say, hey, you know what, You're, I'm, I, I have 9 million followers and here I am chasing down some random Toronto journalist. You're right, I'm, I'm being stupid. I'm the one being stupid, but he, he, never, he never got to that point. It was really, um, it was disappointing. I like Seth Rogen's movies. Well, I was disappointed. He, no, he seems no, like a nice no, guy don't. when you look him on the screen. This is, no, no, this. Can you just pause this part, sorry? Yeah, we're paused. Even Fox News has the, the thing saying, journalist mocked for using dog shampoo. <laughs> That's a story? Yep. That's some, like... Like, yeah? Huh? Yeah. And why, like, I love, like, him being, like, that somehow Seth Rogen is the person who looks foolish because he wouldn't like he kept calling Jonathan K stupid, but it's like, but you also are the one who did the dog shampoo tweet. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Seth Rogen's gonna make fun of me. That's uh, I mean, at least that's closer to being his job. Comedy is closer in his wheelhouse. But yes, it almost feels like Fox News itself is mocking Jonathan K. That's what this almost feels. like. This is unbecoming of you because he went, he, he said, I thought you were the most stupid guy on the planet for the dog shampoo thing. <laughs> well, I mean, that's probably not the end of it, but that's, that's incredible. That's fucking incredible. Now, just for, for completion, uh, since, uh, since we're, we're, we're talking about animals today, and for some reason we have dog shampoo Ugh. guy, and the dog shampoo guy went on the show for the cat guy. So this is this is also what Mark Stein is known for here. Here you go. We don't have to watch the whole thing, obviously. But here he is. And why this happened, I will never know. But he wrote a whole entire album themed on cat. I thought I saw a pussy cat a creeping <laughs> up on me. What the fuck? What the fuck is I he thought I saw a pussy What is wrong with this? I thought I saw a pussy cat. I thought I saw a pussy cat. I thought I saw a pussy cat. I thought. I just want to pause here and acknowledge that, like, almost all of these stupid fuckers that becomes like famous in some capacity, or at least known as like right wing individuals, constantly have these cringy ass shit in their catalog somewhere, and it's like, why? Why does that happen? You could just, you could have just Jody, not made this. You could have done that. Jody, I challenge you to have a little bit more sympathy and think if I suddenly came into so many grifter dollars. <laughs> Fair point. I too would probably do something a little bit weird with it. Fair point. Because I have too much fucking money now. I respect this more than I respect, like, Musk and Bezos type of thing, you know? 
Like at least, at least this dude's doing something funny with his money. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. I mean, we got the amazing William Shatner going, oh my god, because of Bezos, so that's, that's fun. But, like, this, this is a, I mean, like, okay, it's a passion project, but, like, did we need to have you basically argue for genocide against Muslim people in order for you to make your stupid cat video? Like, is, does that what we need? Like, what we should do as a society is just, like, allow conservatives to make their cringy shit. Like, we should have, like, a fun set aside. And this is, of course, once we get resources for all the other things that we definitely need resources for. But we need, like, a slush fund to just, like, ameliorate the stupid desires of conservatives so they don't go out there and commit hate crimes, but instead they make this. You know? Because the only thing that this hurts is my uh, uh, preference for good art. My ears, <laughs> my soul, uh, my eyes. Uh, but we didn't get the course yet, so here we go. <laughs> I saw a pussy cat a creeping up on me. I did. I saw a pussy cat as plain as he could be. He's watching you. I've watched that this pussy way too many times. Very I mean, that's the other thing. Up from... I feel like this is perfectly made for people like me who watch this stuff constantly. It is just amazed by the sheer brilliance of everything that we're taking in right now. We don't need to watch the, the, the whole thing, but, like, there is one God. amazing part, which is where all of a sudden it breaks into Looney Tunes for some reason. If he can just get near, he's getting closer yeah, every it time. It just away. all of a sudden breaks into Looney Tunes. What's that I hear? God. Oh, that's a great place to, to freeze it. Why? I, I don't. I, I blurred out. That was so intense, I blurred out. There we go. Oh, wow. Ben Shapiro is a failed screenwriter. Steve Bannon is a failed movie producer. That's what I'm saying. They just need, we need a slush fund for conservatives to make really cringy, terrible shit that no one wants to watch. Homage to Cat's Pot from Star Trek TOS. Ugh, yes, we do. This is fucking wild. <laughs> Yeah, this is fucking wild. I don't understand why this shit exists, but it does, uh, and it's terrible. I will say as well, again, all these people connect. All the people that we're talking about here are all, like, best friends for some fucking reason. Ezra Levant worked with Mark Stein in order to appeal to Stephen Harper to remove Section 13 of the Human Rights Act. They were the two, like, figures fighting it and changed Canadian legal, uh, they changed the Canadian legal system so that Nazis couldn't be brought to the human rights tribunals for promoting hate speech. Instead, you have to go through the legal system, which has its own barriers of entry. So because of them, because of Mark Stein here, this uh, cat singing person and guy who promoted uh, uh, the white genocide theory, at, but like uh, with Muslims being the ones perpetrating the white genocide, uh, and Ezra, who's just a fucking terrible fascist piece of shit, they changed the structure of our law for the worst, because they're all fucking terrible people. So uh, I would much rather if they just make these things and make shitty posts about using dog shampoo and would just fuck right off completely. Hello, my rebels. Hello, my rebels. I'm a good boy. I'm a weirdo.